All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Barak Halep, and I'm the Associate Director of the World Mission Initiative here at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Uh, we are pleased to welcome you from near and far to this important panel discussion on recalibrating mission, leading in mission through the disruption. As a program here at PTS, WMI is seeking to provide resources to congregational mission leaders as they lead their churches in participating in God's mission. So we are so grateful for this space to gather and discern together with you all the future of our mission engagement. We invite you to type into the chat function your name and where you are now. We'd love to see how far this circle of leaders stretches. We are delighted to have with us three panelists, each of them a leader, scholar, and practitioner. First, we have uh, Reverend Dr. Marsha Snowligan uh, Haney, a retired professor of missiology and religions of the world at the Interdominational Theological Center, Atlanta. Dr. Marsha served in mission in two countries in Africa and currently leads uh, urbanmissiology.org, a, a website dedicated to new understandings of Christian's mission, including the transformational value of short-term mission experiences. Secondly, we have uh, Dr. Kim Lamberti, the executive director of the Quixote Center, where she focuses on sustainable development and advocacy related to Haiti, Nicaragua, and global migration. She is the founder and president of Just Haiti Incorporation, a faith-based uh, fair trade coffee development project, and has been a great resource to short-term mission participants within the Catholic Church here in the United States. And finally, we have Reverend Dr. Juan Sarmiento, the Executive Presbyter of the San Fernando Presbytery within the Presbyterian Church USA in the Los Angeles area, where he serves as a strategic visionary and pastor to the Presbytery's churches and new worshiping communities. Dr. Sarmiento has planted and pastored churches and work in nonprofit leadership in three languages over the past three decades. So we welcome the three of you and are so pleased you can be a part of this timely conversation this evening. For our time together, we will be, take, we will be taking for about uh, 45 minutes to listen to our panelists and we invite you to type in the question you have in the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You don't have to wait until the Q&A time. Uh, so, um, and then we'll have the Q&A. But after the Q&A, we will have a brief announcement and closing remarks before we invite any participants who would like to join a small group discussions. Please note these discussions in groups of three are schedule at the end of our time for leaders interested in sharing their own learnings and hearing from other leaders. You are therefore free to stay on for the small group conversation, or if you prefer, you, you can just leave the meeting. Finally, please make sure to mute your microphone at all times unless you are speaking. And now I would like to welcome my colleague and director of the World Mission Initiative, Reverend Dr. Hunter Farrell, who will be moderating this evening's conversation. Thank you, Bala. Um, and not just for the introduction, but also for all the work that you've done to bring all of us together in this virtual space. Really appreciate uh, the work that you've done. Thank you. Um, Friends, welcome. It's uh, heartwarming to see so many of you and so, from so many different places. Um, the past two years have brought to all of us, uh, all over the world, a seismic shift in a number of areas that touch us intimately, profoundly, and touch our churches in unanticipated ways. A global pandemic that 
profoundly disrupted not just health systems and supply chains, but the stuff that binds us together in human community, who we spend time with, how close we can get to each other, how we protect each other's health. That was one disruption. Um, and then the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis in May 2020 caused a growing number of Americans to see a na the nation's legacy of racial injustice, some of them for the first time. Another disruption, the rise of Christian nationalism has laid bare what to many Americans was an increasingly dangerous conflation of faith and power over the years. And now we're struggling with how we respond. So what does it mean to engage in God's mission of love and justice and peace through the major disruptions of the day? Are there bright spots, opportunities uh, in a time of disruption? Is it a time when we can actually get our, in my, my context, the Presbyterian session off out of its chair and moving again? Um, sometimes disruption is, can be a, a gift, and we want to explore that tonight as well. So I'd like to begin with these uh, three colleagues, uh, Marcia Snelligan Haney, Juan Sarmiento, and Kim uh, Lamberti, um, to think about some questions with us. Um, as Bala said, we'll begin with these questions. We'll open it up to questions from you uh, here in this large room, and then we will um, shift gears and invite uh, folks who would like to stay on to do some small group work in groups of three. And you're welcome to do that, or you can drop out at that time, and we'll let you know when. Um, so to um, Juan and Marcia and to Kim, I'd like to ask you this question. As you think about the multiple disruptions that have impacted our lives and ministries as mission leaders over the past two years, how have these disruptions reshaped the ways that we understand God's mission and what engaging in God's mission will look like in the future? Anybody wanna share some thoughts on that? Sure, I'll share thoughts. Great. I'm glad Great. I'm Great. glad to start and look forward to hearing from my colleagues as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, so I'll, I'll just start out by saying uh, one of the things that COVID um, sh put in very sharp clarity for us is the vast differences between people who have access to wealth, power and medical care and people who do not. And um, for many of us um, working in quote unquote mission territories, places where we are missioners and pastors and believers, we are working in places where people are particularly vulnerable. We work in places where people are extremely poor, where people don't have access to wealth, power, medical care, uh, and other things that some of us do have access to. COVID made that sharply, sharply clear to us. And I, and I do think that that is a call for us in the future as of mission. I have to believe it's a call for us as believers, as pastors, as missioners to concretely address the divide which I am sure we all know is abhorrent to God. And I wanted to say, you know, the history of Christian mission is steeped in the history of colonialism, right? The history of a racist Eurocentric project that created, laid the foundation for much of the divide that we see today and that I believe God is calling us to address concretely. And I don't mean sending our extra stuff. You know, I, I've been working in Haiti for over two decades. I've seen a lot of people send their excess stuff to Haiti, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how do we measure success? Have the communities that we're working in moved the needle? right? Can people take care of their kids? Can they send their kids to school? Do they have access to medical care, clean water? Are their lives dignified lives? And are they able to support their families themselves without our intervention? 
I really, I believe that's the call at this really important moment in time. Hmm. Beautiful, Kim. I'm hearing the concern for disparities in us called as believers to be part of God's intention for uh, less disparities in this world. Um, I'm hearing a call for sustainable development. Beautiful. That's really, uh, really helpful. Uh, Juan, others, uh, Marcia, what, what do folks have to say? Well, Hunter, I really appreciate the way you and Kim have kind of framed all that has occurred within the last couple of years, because it certainly has not been one pandemic, a public health pandemic, but it has, uh, as we like to say, it has uncovered so much that has been wrong with our society, the, the social justice issues, the economic, the education, the housing, and the employment. And we can continue. In fact, it, it can become so overwhelming that even leaders want to just kind of kind of curl up and you know say we'll wait and let someone else deal with this these kinds of issues but i don't think that we have that choice i think that especially as mission leaders we must be willing to to read the signs and to see where we are um i have for about the last 25 years been teaching missions and uh, missiology to a particular wonderful group of seminarians. Uh, they are predominantly African-American seminarians. And for the last 25 years, I have tried, as, as you talked about my experiences in uh, the Sudan and the experiences in Cameroon, based on those, and because they were such eye-opening experiences to me, I was committed to helping my students see an alternative version of mission, that mission does not have to be oppressive but that there is a joy in responding to the call of God. So for this particular community, it's been important to engage them in culturally relevant mission experiences. And yet now I think more than anything that this pandemic has caused us just to simply to stop. It's almost if God is saying, whoa, stop, put a halt on this. What are you doing? What is all this activity? Did I call for this activity? And I think it's just a time for us to stop and look and listen and see what the spirit of God is telling us so that we can help the church to reclaim its focus and its faithfulness on God's mission. Well, uh, <clears throat> I will certainly agree with that, with uh, Kim and Marsha, and again, thank you, Hunter, for having us, and uh, thanks to to all our friends at uh, the World Mission Initiative at Pittsburgh and from uh, so many other places that are joining us for this important conversation. Something that I love about it is the fact that uh, all of us would agree that that mission matters, that it is important to us that it is uh, regardless of the changing uh, conditions um, or even precisely because of the changing conditions, we can, we can affirm um, that uh, our participation in what God is doing in the world is, is crucial and it is important for our lives and for the life of the world. Um, probably something that I would add, um, if anything would be, uh, I think there is a there is a rediscovery of the importance of the role of faith in our lives um, from uh, friends in the Muslim community that have uh, shed tears over the ability to come together and um, and um, uh, break uh, their fasting uh, uh, together uh, once again for churches that have been able to celebrate Easter uh, for the first time in three years. Um, that um, uh, it, it's, uh, in my, my view, a reaffirmation of how important faith is in today's world um, and how uh, at times uh, the, the, the rhythms and the expectations and the assumptions that we have built in our secularized societies um, um, are easily put into, into question when unexpected things 
happen uh, on our midst and uh, in our midst. And, and I think it, it, it represents that disruption also represents, uh, as Marge just said, an opportunity for us to go deeper into our sense of call and a vocation and, and uh, uh, how, how faith has also been a, a very important uh, part of mobilizing people towards greater justice um, during uh, this recent um, uh, events and also um, a source of, uh, of resilience and hope uh, and solidarity that has been so much needed. Mm. Beautiful, um, thanks for that, Juan. Um, I, I'm just aware that uh, that theme uh, that Marcia sets for us of, of reset, kind of stopping, looking, listen, uh, listening, waiting on the Holy Spirit uh, to get a sense of what's next in mission. Um, I think that's that, that's really powerful, and I, I see that in in the work that the three of you are doing. That's that's really helpful. Let me ask you this: I, I think a number of us, I'd include myself, and a lot of mission leaders that I talk to. For, for them, for us, this has been a time of lament. We lament the loss of, of so many things that are important to us. Um, my wife and I worship at a, a small church up the hill from us here in, in uh, east side of Pittsburgh. And during this time, uh, there's probably, I think we have 60 members in the congregation. And uh, we lost uh, six members of the church in the last eight or nine months. And it has just been such a heavy blow to this congregation to watch them look at these pillars, each one of whom. I mean, and there's these moments in the congregation where Sister Anna would always come to the front and say, sisters and brothers, it's time to give. <laughs> Everybody would say, praise the Lord. And they'd pass that and, you know, pass the plate and, and that. But those, we, there's such a sense of lament and loss uh, that compounds loss after loss for so many people. Um, and, and even mission leaders, just as they've lost a sense of connection with their partners, whether local or global, um, the, the, the mission trips have not happened as before, joint projects, um, praying together sometimes has not happened as it has before. Uh, through all this disruption, do you, do you see anything on the other side of lament? Do you see anything helpful to us? Um, I'm thinking uh, specifically, has the disruption enabled us to, out, to rethink some of the outmoded practices of mission that we've been engaged in. Does that, does that resonate with, with you? Well, I, I think certainly, Honor, I think um, one thing that comes to mind is <clears throat> the lament of, of, of having our capacity for um, getting from one place to another restricted. And um, that is something that, um, we are not that used to here in the U.S., yet uh, the rest of the world uh, is quite used to that. And so even with the most powerful uh, passport and even with uh, um, um, the fairly uh, stable um, economy, uh, we have uh, been told that we can't go uh, to, to the places that we were used to. Um, and, and, and I think in some ways that resembles some of what we read, I mean, in, in the in the uh, writings of, of Paul to the churches, right? When he said, I, I hope I can go see you. And, uh, uh, but it, the, there's not um, uh, a, a regularity uh, to it, at least not the regularity that we have built into our churches. So that's certainly a reason for lament. Uh, but also I think um, a much needed, I mean, there are two theological elements that we can, we can in our Christian tradition, we can, we can um, probably um, call upon to think of, 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 of the lament. One is, is fasting. Um, to me, uh, I mean, not being able to get close to the people that, that I love and our par partners in many, in many locations has been like fasting from, from the feast, uh, uh, the joyful feast of the people of God and, and um, um, Lent comes to mind, uh, but Lent as a, an opportunity for formation, for discipleship, for deeper um, um, uh, formation and, and uh, in our lives. And then uh, another one that comes to mind is, is Sabbath um, for uh, hyperactive people uh, that uh, like ourselves, Sabbath can be painful yet uh, necessary. And I think um, that has, uh, this has been a process of, 
so I meant that way, but also hopefully of, of, of uh, the first day of a new creation uh, in, uh, to use uh, biblical language. Mm -hmm. Others? Um, I, I really resonate with what I'm hearing all of you say really, which is kind of get back to the basics, get to the foundation um, and the, fa the fundamentally the foundation of mission is relationship, our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, our relationship with communities that we are um, engaged in. So fundamentally, it's about relationship and about friendship. And in, in my own experience of talking to people that I've worked with in mission for many, many years, people, you ask them, well, why, what's, what, what do you value about our um, engagement with you and your community? And the answer is always friendship, right? Uh, it's always the friendship. And what I, what I hear in Haiti is, you know, you keep coming back, you don't forget us, you know? And I, I think many times, extreme poverty, one of the markers is isolation in this country and overseas. People feel isolated. They don't feel like they're included in, in all of the same types of things that, that, that others are included in. So the friendship, I feel like, and, and to get back to that foundational, the friendship is what matters most of all. And we can maintain in the era of Zoom, you know, even in the farthest corners where almost everyone has a cell phone and is using WhatsApp, we can maintain our friendships, you know, and our solidarity and our love for one another. Um, and I just, I think it's, 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 that's where we are. I would just add to that. So what, what happens then out of that friendship? Because if your friendship is real, and you're having honest conversations. It takes a while to get there with any friend, you know, but if you're having honest conversations, you know, what's the purpose of our mission trips? You know, what are these shared projects? Who, who benefits from this? Is the community really benefiting from this or is it we're, we're trying to nurture our own spiritual growth, maybe at the expense of, of, of the community? So out of friendships friendship we ask ourselves those questions we hold ourselves to a high standard and we and we ask the communities that were in those questions too how can i be useful i ask you know as a missioner what what am i what am i actually useful for you know and we hear some stories of people who say the best part about the short term mission group is when they leave <laughs> you know so 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 what is what am I useful for for them and 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 that I think we need to ask ourselves and we do need to take a step back and evaluate like our has has our has the Christian mission project really evolved away from its colonial past? Mm -hmm. How far have we evolved, and what would it look like? to evolve completely, what would that look like, hmm. right? And, and I, I, I'm not sure I have the, I, I don't wanna pretend like I have an answer except to say, I know it starts with friendship. I know that much. Hmm. And then it's out of that friendship, out of that love that everything else happens. Hmm. And the other thing I know is that, and I said it already, but I just, I'm gonna repeat it because I think it, I just need to, that that the, this vast divide between uh, you know, one community and another, communities that have access and communities that don't, that vast, vast divide, I just believe God abhors that divide and God calls us mm. to, to act. Mm. Mm. Thanks for that, Kim. So, so in this time of, uh, to use uh, Juan's imagery, in this time of, of fasting, right, where we haven't been able to be with, do you all see people nurturing? I mean, I, I think all of us would agree that that relationship is the heart of, of, of Christian mission, right? That um, with the coming of Jesus Christ, that spreading circle of love that passes from person to person and transformed lives, 
that's what it's all about. And we see the fruits of that being uh, righteousness and justice, uh, a, a lessening of that disparity that casts some into the pit of never having enough, uh, of children, children not being able to be educated well, et cetera. I think that's really, uh, I, think that's, I think that's important. Um, thanks for, for, for sharing that, uh, Kim. Um, Doug, I see you at, and asking a question. The, the need to ask, adding to Kim's comments, the need to ask, what can we let go of now that we've been forced to stop, listen, fast, and reset? Do you all see some elements that we need to let go of now in, in our mission? You speak of kind of wanting to encourage us to decolonize our mission efforts, because I, I continually am, uh, God opens my eyes to see that there are still elements of colonialism in, in the ways that I engage in mission, and it just it, it, it pulls me up cold when I see it. Um, are you all seeing uh, folks finding ways to nurture relationship, nurture friendship in this time of, it has, has felt like a time of fasting? I think I've, I think I've seen it in many ways. Um, it has truly been a time of, of lamenting. And I think in the midst of that, we have seen kind of clearly what it is that we desire. And I think, Kim, you, you hit it right on the point. We want intentional, authentic relationships. I think that's what, you know, at least for me, out of this pandemic, that is what the strongest desire has been. Authentic relationship with God, authentic relationship with one another. And of course, that means we have to be willing to look at ourselves and be authentic and, and to be honest with what we see. But I'm hearing from many churches that in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of lamenting, and I know so many congregations that have had to say farewell to their loved ones by video and, and not in person. Um, out of this, we realize that because we're able to talk about public loss, of so many loved ones in our congregations, in our community, that this somehow gives us permission to talk about grief. And when we talk about grief in the midst of, of our communities, then we are able to see that, yes, we may lament, but we're not lamenting alone, that there are others in our community who are grieving. And I cannot help but think about the children in our community who's lost loved ones, who's lost parents, who's lost siblings. And yet churches have been able to find a way to provide um, support for those in their community. It's almost like if there is a will, we'll hmm. find a way to reach out hmm. and to make a difference in our community. Hmm. But uh, the pandemic, again, blew the roof off the house. We see the suffering. We see opportunities that perhaps we haven't seen before because we've been locked up in our, in the four walls of our church buildings and, you know, could feel very comfortable there. But now, because of a sense of being faithful to God, we realize we have to go out into the communities <laughs> as friends, Kim, just as you said, as, as intentional, authentic friends, yeah. Beautiful. I'm thinking of an example. Um, I was in class on Monday night and uh, alum from Pittsburgh Seminary by the name of uh, Pastor Ben T, who pastors the Westmont Presbyterian Church in Johnstown, uh, Pennsylvania. Ben shared the example, and I'm, I'm going to ask if you all are seeing this kind of thing in your context. In the, uh, we didn't mention as a disruption, the increasing intensity of storms across the country. Though all of us are, if you're like me, you're glued to the six o'clock news saying, you know, when is the next wave coming through? Even in Pennsylvania, we've been uh, struggling with, with tornadoes uh, that we haven't seen in this way. Um, ben shared the story with uh, students in our class of when uh, a particularly um, damaging uh, series of tornadoes came through the two congregations he was pastoring in Iowa. This was two years ago, the summer, late summer of 2020. Um, and it destroyed several houses in the two communities where he pastors. Um, trees were fallen, roads were cut off. It was some serious damage. And Pastor Ben gets on his bike, puts on his pastoral collar, puts his bike helmet on and goes to see what's happening. And 
there's this, and what I was hearing, and I think what students heard is when they discussed it after his after he left our conversation, that ministry of presence, that that the, that disaster time, that time, all of a sudden, we're in a completely new social space with each other. The old, this is my pattern behavior, that breaks down, and I reach out to neighbor. And suddenly the mayor <clears throat> sees him, grabs him, and says, let's go, we need to be praying with people. And so <laughs> the mayor of a town in Iowa and a Presbyterian minister are together praying for people. Um, it just strikes me that these th th this disruption opened up a new way for Pastor Ben in his, in his own context uh, to be the church in a particular moment. Um, is disruption opening up new spaces uh, for ministry and for mission among us? What are you all seeing from the vantage points that you have? In the context of the Presbytery of San Fernando, a region of churches uh, in the northwest part of the Los Angeles area, we, we have um, um, perhaps half of our population will be Hispanic and um, um, something that we have as, uh, you know, is, is a typical uh, uh, expression in Presbyterian circles. We do so, we're, we're so bad in, in connecting with the Hispanic population. So I, I think that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm there, but um, uh, and, and they extended an invitation for me to serve in that capacity. But, but I, 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 be, before I arrived, there was a newfound desire um, of connecting uh, with the Hispanic population. Um, and um, one, one of the examples is someone that grew up in, in one of our churches, was baptized in one of our churches, uh, Manny Flores, um, uh, as a young person, got involved with uh, with gangs, and um, probably not not the story that uh, we make more widely known. Uh, but but yet the Presbytery people in the Presbytery, pastors and elders and, and others, uh, stayed in communication with him um, as he was in prison, and then he was finally released. Um, and they nurture um, the relationships with him to the point of him becoming the executive director of a, of a nonprofit organization uh, called, uh, called North Valley Caring Services. But that organization has probably grown tenfold during the duration of the of pandemic in terms of, of uh, its impact um, in the communities. And um, uh, whereas we probably saw before, um, uh, someone like Manny as well, we're, this is such a different person we don't know how to connect with, to seeing him as a partner um, mm -hmm. in God's work in the region, um, and then plus the, the, the uh, development of, of, of three more new worshiping communities in Spanish. Um, um, so this pandemic has been fruitful for us to um, look around and say, hey, um, let's be more um, uh, let's be more open to how God might have us uh, connect and develop relationships and friendships and partnerships uh, with people that, uh, that uh, otherwise we, we wouldn't have noticed. Yeah, I would just add to that, um, speaking from my own cultural context, you know, which is base, which is white middle class, it is the hardest thing to get people to do to cross uh, especially a wealth divide um, for friendship. It is crossing any divide actually, but it is extremely difficult to get people to do. People are very happy to serve. You know, they'll, they'll go to the soup kitchen. You know, they'll go to Haiti and build a house. They'll do all sorts of service related things. They'll send a check to service organizations, but real friendship that crosses the, the divide that all of us are talking about is extremely difficult to get people to do as, um, and, and I, I, I think that it's what our short-term mission can aspire to, right? Can aspire to the goal of developing real relationships across the divide instead of our short-term mission is designed to go build something or teach something or serve something or has some sort of do something connected to it, 
and instead to refocus how we do short-term mission and have it focused on friendship and, and finding ways to cross that divide. Here, yeah, may I ask a, a, a question? Um, do you think that the class divide is greater than the other social divides? And if so, why? Gosh, I don't, I, I would, I would hate to say I, you know, I would, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's probably both and. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, it, it, it feels like this, this, this time of, of pandemic, this time of kind of uh, a coming uh, a coming out of our sleepfulness with regard to uh, the racial divide and racial injustice in this country. It, it feels like this is an invitation to reset, right? To, to stop and to ask some of these deeper questions, go back to basics as, as Kim mentioned. Um, I'm wondering, are you seeing examples of people who are, uh, I think the call to, to me, the call is to slow mission to slow ourselves down, to begin to ask some of those deeper questions that, that Kim referred to, that, that Marsha mentioned in her opening conversation. I, I'm just wondering, are you all seeing leaders who are, who, who are finding the courage, right, to take advantage of this disruption and step into the gap and say, let's, let's begin to think more deeply. Do you see people uh, going deeper into biblical studies with with their mission uh, mission faithful, their their mission participants, their mission committees, looking to scripture, looking to prayer, looking to connect with global partners, with local partners uh, via Zoom or other ways to be praying with each other. Um, do you see this? It, to me, it's been kind of a call to contemplation, which in my activist little self is not a comfortable place to be. That that authenticity, Marcia, that you mentioned, it causes us to ask deep and, and sometimes uncomfortable questions about ourself. Um, are you all seeing leaders beginning to um, find the courage to, to slow things down and, and, and go deeper with their people? Yeah. It's a great question because the time, the sense of time has changed and timing. Uh, you know, all of us have difficulties knowing what day of the, uh, of the week it is and <laughs> what month we're living uh, because of our rhythms have changed have changed so much. But I, I, I can tell you, I mean, a very si small but significant element is that um, this Monday we will have uh, perhaps the first retreat in our presbytery in, in, in uh, at least the last 20 years, retreat of pastors. And so we have been busy uh, and there's always reasons why, well, there are also everybody finds their way of nurturing and cultivating their spiritual life. And this Monday we will, we will finally come together, um, people that are starting new worshiping communities and, and pastors of established churches Come together for a day apart, and, and I think it's, it's very significant. I think it is um, it is meaningful um, that way. But that, at the same time, WhatsApp has increased our capacity. And by the way, I want to promote WhatsApp. I think it's a great tool uh, for communication, rather than other uh, platforms that I'm not going to mention. But um, uh, the, the, uh, for one, uh, the majority of people around the world uses it. Uses uses it, and and for and, and it is just a, a, a very useful way of, of passing on information and and other things among people. So um, that has increased our capacity, I believe, and uh, and and I wouldn't call it necessarily slowing. I mean, in some ways, slowing down. But I would say more than that is recognizing that that it is about it is God's work. God is the one that sends us uh, in mission, and uh, and and doesn't send exclusively uh, the wealthier uh, or the, uh, the the more powerful. But uh, all of God's people are being sent, uh, and so I think that recognition of of sentness by other people increases our. our are, are, are speeding in ways that we didn't anticipate because we thought we were the ones that needed to move faster, uh, where we realized that God, God is moving God's own people uh, much faster than we, can, we could ever move ourselves. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Maybe that's helpful, Juan. Maybe so. Maybe rather than uh, slowing it down, in, in a sense, in a, in a sense, it is a recentering of mission. Maybe mission, as I've engaged in it myself, has been a little too centered on me. Right? I'm thinking more of what do I need to accomplish God's mission? I am God's hands and feet, which is a a metaphor that I don't see as much in scripture as I do on our mouths and tongues, right? Um, so I'm, I, I wonder if this is a time of recentering where we can remember that it is God's joyful invitation to all of us to join God and what God is doing in this world and to align ourselves with that, to move into that space. Um, that to me feels a lot uh, less guilt, <laughs> guilt invoking than uh, I often, you know, and it's like it's out of a sense of duty as opposed to a sense of, of joyful acceptance of an invitation that's been given to me. Yeah. I would just add like um, a, a refocus and a recentering away from self, because I, I agree with what you said. A lot of mission has been about how, how my students are going to benefit or how I'm going to be more spiritually, I'm going to gain something spiritually from this, but refocus on God. But, but, in refocusing on God, the focus becomes the other, mm. right? Not the self, but the other mm. and the good of the other. And then how is whatever it is I'm doing serving the good of the other? And how do I know I'm doing it, right? Mm. Beautiful. I'm thinking of a phrase. Go ahead. Were you going to no, say something? I, I was, um, also a ref focusing from our resources too. I think so often we tend to focus on our resources and what we think we can accomplish with our resources, et cetera, et cetera, without realizing that mission is a it's two party thing that we need to be able to receive as well as to give. But I am hoping that this pandemic has helped us to kind of look at our, our mission partners who have not lived in the luxury and the, the opulence that we have. And to notice that they have lived in times of crises all the time, the Sudanese, the Cameroonians, the Ethiopians, et cetera, et cetera, the Haitians. Um, and they have learned to pull on their spiritual resources and to develop them in ways that we have not. And perhaps we can begin to recognize that this is something that we need to learn from them as well. Mm. Amen, sister. Mm. Beautiful, Marcia. Thanks for that. I'm thinking, is that one of the attractions of mission, particularly short-term mission, when we're able to go to a community where people have grown, have, have sunk their roots deeply into the spirit? They have, they have been nurtured uh, in difficult times, to, and, and there's no illusion in their mind that you know, their salvation is in their own hands, that their security is in their own hands, but rather they know that in life and in death, they belong to God, something that we believe in our creeds, but we don't often practice because there's so many illusions in, in, our, in our mind, in our, in our society that make us think that we're responsible for ourselves, right? There's, there's the first lie. Um, we're responsible for each other is what scripture tells us. So I'm, I'm just wondering, it, it, it feels like this is a, a, an invitation. It, it, something, one of the aspects that draws our people into mission and draws me into mission is the sense that I'm able to walk side by side with someone. I, I remember my next door neighbor when I worked in DR Congo, uh, Pastor Mukuna, who I, I had never been to so many babies' funerals in my life. And I was at the edge of depression. I was sinking because I, I couldn't find hope because I had been a rather privileged suburban Christian most of my life. And I had not had to uh, rely on that uh, the deep faith that Pastor Mukuna had developed over time. So he had in his leadership and in his uh, neighborliness with me, we were next door neighbors, um, he was able to draw on this sense of, of deep resilience, a deep centeredness in God in Christ, that I found, I, I suddenly I realized I was kind of in shallow water. I needed to, I was being pulled out into the deep and I didn't know how to handle it. So I do think, uh, Marcia, you're right, that there is a, a deeper resilience. What, what other, let me ask you one more question before we open it up to the group. Um, just in terms of leadership, are you seeing particular leadership qualities come to the fore that are particularly useful 
for people who were leading their congregations in these uh, times of disruption? What is the, how, is, how has the shape of leadership changed in these, in these years? What is it that we need as the people of God for our leaders? I think it's a great question. And I, I, th I suspect I'm gonna answer this differently from Marcia and Juan, um, which is a good thing. I, th I think all three of us are gonna have, um, you know, different and excellent answers, I hope. Anyway, I, what I would say is this is a call to take great risk hmm. um, with the potential for great, for creating something great. Hmm. Um, and the reason that I say, I say it's risky because of all the things we've all already said, because it's so difficult to get people to do what we're saying we think needs to happen. It's easy to get people to serve at a, at a soup kitchen. It's easy to get people to send a check to an organization or a church that's doing service. It's very difficult to, to focus on friendship. Um, and it's very difficult to get people to follow you if you're saying that's, that's your message. And it's very difficult to raise money for it. You know, it's a, to raise money, not only for a, a friendship based mission, but for one that says, you know, everything that we said about resilience is true. And I have 55 stories from Haiti that, that will say the same thing. And at the same time, we have to stop tolerating it. We can't tolerate it. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. try to raise money for that, because in the end, we have to raise money to pay for this work. Mm -hmm. Right. We can't tolerate it. And in order to not tolerate it, we have to create something completely new outside of the boxes that people are operating from. And it, it requires great risk, I think. Hmm. So dare to risk, that's a, that's a call, I, that's a word. I, I'm hearing strongly from you, Kim, beautiful. Other, other qualities of leadership that you're seeing emerging or that you sense there's a need for among God's people today? One thing that I think we need is a relevant, faithful theology of mission. Mm -hmm. I think it needs to be one that a pastor and congregation together are willing to, to, to I like to use the word to wrestle with, using Jacob and the angel, to wrestle with and, and to come to an understanding and it's not just a head trip but it has to begin you know with thinking about God's mission what is God's mission how do we embrace God's mission and so that it results in being a living theology of mission hmm. and I think again we have to start with the basics for example how did we learn about human diversity what did we learn was it the Tower of Babel? Was it something else? Um, I think we just need to go back to the ABCs, the basics, and begin to develop a theology of mission that will allow us to listen and to hear clearly God and move us forward with excitement into the unknown future. We don't know if the pandemic is over or not, but what we have learned is that we do need courageous leaders. We do need leaders who are willing to to risk and and not be afraid to trust God. Hmm. Beautiful. Well, uh, a word that comes to mind is is um, incarnational uh, in the sense that not not that we partake of 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 Christ's nature, but the reality of of um, um, investing ourselves in, in the relationships enough for us to um, be uh, to, to be vulnerable and to be even corrected by the people that we are serving and the people that will serve us too. Uh, I, I think um, um, that the, uh, the, the, the woman uh, by the well, right? Jesus offered living water and Jesus was was willing to drink the water uh, that that woman had available for him um, I think 
I think we, I, I anticipate that we will, I mean, and this, this, this might sound uh, as a contradiction, but even with the increase of, of, of digital connections, uh, uh, the proliferation, proliferation of, of digital connections has created more of a hunger of real relationships rather than less uh, of that. Hmm. And so I anticipate a um, re, um, uh, surgeons of of people that will invest years um, uh, and and, uh, and in in a particular location with a particular community, rather than um, kind of the trend that we had, where uh, there was the ability uh, because our capacity to um, kind of to uh, be exposed to a variety of different communities without a real um, uh, relationships. Beautiful, Juan, thank you for that. Thank, thanks to all three of you for that. I'm thinking um, just as we're seeing kind of uh, what uh, Thomas Friedman described as the flattening of the world, or he wasn't the first, but one, one of the many who described as the flattening of our world. Uh, mission decisions used to be made by the mission elites. Now they're made in every congregation, right? Uh, we're, each of our congregations is in a sense a mission agency. Um, with that flattening, there's a shift in leadership too, right? Um, it used to be that uh, uh, leadership or authority was ascribed by a system. You know, if you did these certain degrees, if you, you know, put your time in, if you got appointed to the position, then they gave you the authority. Now the shift is really more towards achieved authority. So even young people who haven't done their time in the system, they show a particular skill or a gift or a sense of calledness to leadership and people begin to follow them. Those are the people, right, that, that, that uh, uh, have, have achieved that, that, that level of authority. So I think we are seeing some significant shifts in leadership and that the pandemic and the other disruptions have only served to, uh, to accelerate. Um, um, Emmanuel Cuisera uh, asks this question. There are still many people who are in isolation because of pandemic consequences. They're not ready to come back to the church and online services. In which effective ways can we address this situation, this, this issue? In other words, how do we break through that isolation when people are still fearful of getting back together? Do y'all have some ideas for that? I have had an idea. I have been thinking about it for so long because of that very issue. And I realize that there are a lot of older people in isolation. There are young children that are in isolation. And I thought about creating a, a mission called Good Night, My Friend. And that is simply having church members do something as simple as just call on church members and just see how they're doing at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day. It doesn't matter. But it's the idea of putting that human face and that human voice together. And even if you're not willing to come out and you know worship together, but at least to be able to pick up a phone and know that someone cares. I mean, that is so elementary to me, but we've got to find just basic ways of connecting with each other and mm -hmm. just saying, you know, good night, my friend, how are you? It's, you know, just simple ways. Uh, we don't mm -hmm. have to make it complicated. Right, beautiful. Other thoughts that come to your minds? Well, there, there is certainly the need for respect and, and uh, the need for allowing um, our neighbors and our uh, uh, and uh, other people in the world inviting us. And, and, and so I think more than ever, that is, that is uh, uh, clear, you know, uh, these times remind us of that, that, um, we, we enter another person's or another community space, a sacred space um, and with great caution. And, and I, I think um, and sensitivity, in our case, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. How is the Spirit present drawing us and making possible that encounter? Um, I, I like the, the metaphor of encounter uh, as, as mission as much as, as being sent. And um, um, I, I think ultimately it is the work of the spirit to open those uh, opportunities, open up those opportunities and, and give us the courage to walk in. Uh, and at times also um, um, be a little 
you know, um, probably unexpectedly, right? We can we can enter those spaces, but uh, certainly the element of sensitivity uh, and courage need to be present. Hmm. Well, continuing with that idea of encounter, um, I'm going to ask Bobby, if you would, Bobby, to uh, reset the um, uh, configuration of the screen so that we can see all the faces, because we'll, we'd like to open this up to a bit more of a, of a conversation, if we can do that. Um, I'd like to, um, RJ says this, a quality that is needed, reciprocal hospitality in a diaspora context being willing to be the guest that is less comfortable, less in control, as well as the host. And the, uh, RJ muses here, I wonder how many Afghans here in the United States have had no guests come these past three days of the Eid, the, the holiday here at the close of Ramadan. How many were willing to be their guests? To have guests for the end of Ramadan is so valued by Central Asians and, 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 and many others, right? Um, beautiful, beautiful question. And let me just um, ask again, Bobby, if you wouldn't mind reconfiguring this so we can see all the all the faces uh, together, that that would be helpful. Um, RJ, do you want to comment on that because you're you're speaking from a particular, a very timely concern. This it's been during this uh, pandemic, in fact, when suddenly we're seeing a good number of um, Afghan refugees. Uh, Come, come to our shores in, in surprising numbers and a surprising, uh, in a surprising moment. Um, what's your sense of that? Well, yeah, some of you know me, um, will recognize me, but uh, yeah, no, I, I went, I was fortunate to make a connection with some recently arrived refugees and I went to their, to their apartment on Monday and they were thrilled because their relatives are back in Afghanistan. And so the relatives aren't coming by for the Eid. Uh, but I wonder how many sat alone. Um, I'm doing some research, I hope, if I can get it by the doctoral committee. Um, and I, one of my questions to volunteers who are teaching ESL to Afghans, I'm going to go, did you go visit them on the Eid? Uh, because, of course, they would have been waiting for you to come, even if we don't realize that. Right. It would have been, oh, of course you can come. Uh, right. But that's, a, that's something we don't think of just going over right. if they don't invite very explicitly. For them, it's often assumed. And if they say, oh, please come, they really mean it. Beautiful. Thank you for that. So we we would make an appointment. We would call before we go, and, and you're 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 uh, helping us to realize that there's a deep uh, a deep longing uh, to be visited in those closing days of Ramadan. Beautiful. To, so to be to love our neighbor across those lines of difference means to understand from their perspective. That's that's really helpful. Thank you for that. Um, Right, so we can't change, uh, I'm sorry, we, we have moved to the, the final view. If you just click on, um, uh, in terms of the views, if you click on gallery view in the top right-hand corner, you'll be able to see everyone's face. Um, um, uh, Robert, yes, thanks, uh, raises a question. How about mission in our own backyard? Um, say a word about that, D define your backyard for us. Who is my neighbor, said the, said the lawyer. <laughs> Let me ask that question, Who, who's, where, where is my backyard? Say a word, please. Well, I'm, I'm in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, about 30 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. But uh, actually, the, who is your neighbor? That, that's a different story altogether. <laughs> I believe that that's anybody anywhere yeah, yeah. is your neighbor. But yeah. you need to start taking care of people in your own backyard. Hmm. Hmm. If everybody did that, then you wouldn't have to take care of people in other people's backyard. You sense it's an either or, Robert? Are we looking at a both and? Uh, are different people called into to different aspects of that? or are Different you... people are called into different aspects of that. Mm -hmm. I don't drive. Mm -hmm. I won't fly. Right. So I'm one who's going to take care of people in my own backyard. <laughs> right. Helen, share with us. You've got a, a word, an uh, experience there with, some Af with an Afghan family. Say a word about that. Oh, it's not me. It's actually my uh, friends, Bruce and Linda here in Pasadena, California. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they asked me to go over and take care of their dog yesterday because they were going to be gone the entire afternoon and evening. Uh, they're uh, going to a town south of 
Pasadena to pick up this Afghan family living in a hotel and they were going to go like all the way up towards Santa Barbara, which is quite a distance to take the Afghan family to other I don't know if it was other Afghans who are living up like on the coast or like just other Muslim friends of theirs but they so they gave this Afghan family that ride which is sort of like a you know two hour trip one way and mm -hmm. then Bruce and Linda and their disabled son Curtis stayed for the meal they didn't get back till late last night and I'm assuming that on the way back, they dropped off the Afghan family back at their hotel and, you know, the town south of Pasadena and then came home. So anyway, that was just really uh, kind of them. But I mean, the fact that they participated in the celebration and stayed with all of these Muslims and of course, they're Jesus followers, my friends. But so I appreciate what people are saying about how valuable it is to have guests for this particular celebration at the end of Ramadan, because that's what Bruce and Linda and Curtis got to experience here in my region yesterday. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for that. I, I'm thinking, uh, and maybe the rest of you feel this way as well, it's just, if there's a snapshot of mission, uh, mission as loving the neighbor across lines of difference, speaking the language that they that they understand, and uh, to someone who's wanting to, has a deep desire to celebrate the end of Ramadan, it sounds like a beautiful way to help your neighbor to do that. That's a, what a great example. That'll, that image will stay in my mind for a while. Other other questions, other um, thoughts that you have on this. We'll take maybe one more question or so, and then we'll um, uh, uh, have a couple of announcements that we'd like to share with you. Dr. Matt, I, I, may I uh, follow up on Robert's yeah. comment? And I think it's absolutely uh, important that during this pandemic that we realize that perhaps the a new mission field is our neighborhood, is our community, whether we're talking about our Afghan refugees or, you know, neighbors who are just neighbors. But I think it's time, you know, a hundred years ago, we were all caught up into foreign missions. But I think now mission is at home right now. It's crossed the various divisions. Um, Kim was talking about perhaps class, and I know Juan deals with cultural and language, I deal with ethnicity and race, and we all are deal dealing with different issues in our community, but I do feel that perhaps it's the time now for us to look at home missions and see it as global missions, and Juan used the term a couple of days ago about the global mission, so it's no longer foreign missions or home missions, but it's one mission. And we're all called to be faithful where we are. You know, the disciples started in Jerusalem and then Judea, then Samaria to the ends of the world. But somehow we, we know it is most challenging to do mission at home. And I think that is where our real calling is at this time. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you for that, Marsha. Good. I would, I would say, um, that, um, I mean, it's one, one thing that we've learned through COVID. Um, I remember uh, being in communication with our friends and partners in, in China and hearing about how they were dealing with, with the a pandemic there. And they felt so far and so remote. Um, and then uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a few weeks, we started hearing about the first cases here. I would say that one of the things that, uh, along with COVID, uh, the rise of, um, of um, well, the, the, the reality, the reckoning with, with, uh, of, of, of uh, racial justice and, and, and uh, the reality of Black Lives Matter as a global movement. I mean, uh, so two things that come to the forefront is that um, all mission is global, uh, that it is impossible to not uh, be involved um, uh, if in mission in a way that that impacts other parts of the world, and that what happens in other parts of the world will impact us as well. Uh, so, and and I would say, I mean, this might uh, might be uh, kind of the idealistic uh, element in me, but the Christian community is wide, is spread out enough 
um, to, to be able to see things in this, uh, this perspective that is not one or the other, but Acts 1.8 uh, from Jerusalem and it, both Jerusalem and at the ends of the earth. Beautiful, Wang. Uh, Pastor Ben, I see your hand up. Welcome. Thank you, Hunter. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Panel. Um, it's been a very enriching time to listen to your words of wisdom and uh, contributions on mission. I don't have a question, but then I just want to add to the enrichment on the uh, platform by saying that uh, in recalibrating mission, um, the tools of mission never gets outmoded. You know, when you go down to uh, the Acts of the Apostles, one of the tools of mission was uh, fellowship, the koinonia, building a space for people of all uh, creed, culture, and uh, different backgrounds to come to the same space in love to um, get to know the man called Jesus Christ and how the incarnation through Jesus Christ has touched so many lives. And uh, um, that uh, spirit of koinonia is still active mm -hmm. and is still fruitful if we will continue to use it in our church, be it whether in COVID uh, time or post COVID, it still does a miraculous work of getting people to experience the love of God. The, 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 um, the awareness of koinonia mm -hmm. helps us to extend ourselves to be God's hands and feet mm -hmm. in our world today. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only that, but then having the courage to go to places that under normal circumstance we will not go to, and to talk to people that under normal circumstances we will not talk to. Mm -hmm. That is the mission that the uh, early apostles showed. And I guess that is what God is calling us today because we live in a time that we are being pushed from all corners of the world to define who we are as Christians. Mm -hmm. Now, when you take the Banner research recently, it talks about how secularism it's increasing at a faster pace compared to the growth of Christianity. So uh, as present day Christians, we really have to go back and reflect as to how we could be able to let God's impact be felt by people who now feel like, I don't need Christ again in my life. I don't need God again in my life. I can do it on my own. And that is why mission this day is very, very important, not only by going overseas, but especially in our own communities. Uh, you, talk to, you talk about people in the rural America. Mm. I mean, uh, there is so much uh, uh, work to be done in rural America, whereby uh, people now do not see the need to even go to church again mm. because um, they don't see the power and experience the power of, uh, uh, of God in their lives so much so that they go on to, I mean, meth and uh, drug addiction and all that, which is rampant mm. in these rural places. But you see, when people find the dependence on God is, uh, is satisfying, mm. it makes them experience the meaning of having Christ in their hearts. And that is the uh, the, the, the job we have, the great ends of the church where uh, the Presbyterian Book of Order talks about proclaiming the word of God in the way that people will experience the power, the, the power of God in their lives, that God is still alive and mm. rules in the affairs of mm. man. Thank you. Pastor, Pastor Ben, you're a blessing. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Marsha, I'm, I'm, I'm moved to close us in prayer. I wonder if I'll ask you to close us in prayer in just a, a moment. I want to thank uh, Rich Noble for his, um, here, here in Pittsburgh, uh, who teaches mission. Um, one mission expressed locally, regionally, and globally. I think we're, we're, the Spirit has opened all of our eyes to this reality. I think our kids and grandkids generation gets this much better than we do. They are so much more globally focused. I think they get this reality. So 
Uh, praise God for that. I, uh, my, uh, ma ma my Congolese neighbor that I mentioned, Pastor Mukwena, his translation of the Great Commission was, as you are going, baptize. It, 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 the sense of you, we're all on the way. We're, every moment is an encounter. As you do this, baptize, teach them all that you've learned, and I will be with you throughout the ends of the age. So um, what a blessing. I, I've appreciated this time. Dr. Marsh, if you'd be willing to close us this section in prayer, and then we'll, um, I'd like for us to have a few announcements, and then we'll break into small groups of people who would like to. But if we could all stay on for this prayer and the announcements, would you mind? Thanks. Thank you. Let us pray. Most gracious and merciful God, we are so thankful for this evening. We give you thanks for this opportunity to come from various places, various homes, even various countries, to gather in your presence. Lord, teach us. With open hearts and open minds, we want to learn from you. We know that we need to learn from you. We know, oh God, that mission belongs to you, and we're just thankful that you have asked us to participate in it. We pray, oh God, that you will help us to be better missionaries for you, that you will put in us new hearts, new minds, new spirits that are willing to follow you even to the ends of the earth. We thank you for this opportunity. And as we have this opportunity, oh God, we pray that opportunities will be made for others who, like us, want to grow closer to your heart in mission. We thank you for one another. We thank you for Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And most of all, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has showed us what it is that you expect of us. He has showed us the way and asked that we follow him. Bless us, O oh God, so that we might be a blessing to your people. Dismiss us from this session that we might continue to fellowship with one another in the spirit of love and peace and joy and justice. This we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Bala, I think you have some announcements for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, for for um, leading this conversation and for moderating this conversation, Hunter, and for um, Juan and Kim and Marsha for sharing. Uh, so now before I dismiss you all to either leave this event or stay on and join a small group, I would like to just draw your attention to our upcoming events that may be interest to you as leaders. Um, so don't uh, worry for some of the details, we'll send you an email with uh, some of the lists. So first is the WMI Biennial Conference that coming up uh, this uh, coming October uh, 7 to 8, um, we'll be um, having it as a, in a hybrid format with Reverend Eugene uh, Cho, who is a renowned church planter and dynamic um, new president CEO of Bread for the World as keynote speaker. So this conference will focus more on what it means to be a mission leader in a time of disruption. So this is kind of a continuation of what we already uh, uh, heard here. So uh, keep that in mind for that conference. And secondly, we have next week, next Wednesday um, at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Dr. Scott Hagley, our uh, pro uh, professor of missiology, will be um, presenting his uh, lecture um, on uh, entitled Masking American Gods, Making Place, Embracing Immanence, and Cultivating Community ahead of his installation to the chair in the fall of 2022. So um, the link for registration is there. And finally, we would like to invite you to join us for Pittsburgh Seminary's uh, book talk on Friday, uh, May 13 at 4 p.m., uh, where Hunter and I will present our book, Free Congregational Mission, uh, that was published by Interversity Press. Um, that's specifically designed for congregational mission leaders. 
Uh, so now we would like to um, express our sincere thank to all our uh, three pan uh, panelists who took their time to share with us ideas and innovative ways we can stay engaged in God's mission. Um, we we really enjoy and we we just want to say thank you so much for your wisdom and leadership and and thank to all of you who joined in the conversation tonight so let give us uh, let give everyone a hand of applause